Well, thank you. Uh, it's very nice to be back. And um, I wanted to thank uh, Karen Schneider and, and Jamie Penn in particular for inviting me back. I uh, feel like I've, I've had the honor to do this every year or so, or every other year or so. So it's, it's been a, a good run. Um, I thought uh, I thought they were going to give me the topic of, of talking about ag policy under a Trump presidency, but uh, uh, just a joke, small joke. Uh, but instead, I'm going to talk about um, agricultural trade in developing countries, uh, which is something that I, both uh, of the previous speakers have alluded to, and I know there was a lot yesterday in, in the on the program about that. I also want to talk, uh, I'll talk at the end about what's going on in, in those countries, in many of those countries, in terms of agricultural support, which I think also is very, very uh, interesting. First, let me start with a, a slide on just global trade. And I put the launch of the Uruguay or the uh, Doha round uh, on here, not to make any causality there. It's almost in spite of the fact that there was no major uh, agreement in Doha or that, that the major things that people were looking for, uh, things like market access and domestic support. Despite that, we've seen a tripling of, of world trade since 2001. And obviously, a lot of that are nominal effects with, with things like uh, ethanol expansion and, and the, um, you know, what's been going on in energy markets and, and macro, uh, other macro factors. But if you look at most volumes for most of the major grains and, and oil seeds, you see, you know, very robust annual growth. Uh, particularly for things like soybeans, but but also uh, maize, also uh, um, you know uh, wheat and rice as well. But I'm going to focus uh, on what's been going on in South South trade, and I think there too you see this am amazing um, uh, uh, growth. And here is essentially uh, trade to developing countries, and you can see that while. Uh, North-South trade has increased a lot, and, and Mary alluded to how important things like uh, uh, soybeans are to the U.S. market, uh, soybean imports from China. But the other uh, striking thing is just the growth of South-South trade. Now, a lot of that, obviously, are, are, are the big ag juggernauts like, like Brazil, but uh, again, uh, big increases in South-South uh, trade. Um, here shows the exports from developing countries, so South exports to both uh, developed markets, and you can see there uh, again that that the growth there has been um, uh, somewhat flatter. I mean, it's it's still been an increase, but somewhat flatter, um, and that reflects uh, or is very very similar to what you might see on Australia's export profile or the U.S. export profile. That is exports to other developed countries has been fairly flat with, with a little bit of growth, but most of that has, the growth has come in developing countries. And again, the, the exports, you can see that the share of, of uh, South exports to other South uh, countries have, um, have increased substantially. Now here is, uh, again, uh, using 2013, which is uh, uh, as a basis, it shows the largest developing country exporters. And you can see, you know, uh, again, Brazil, not a big surprise. China, a bit of a surprise, at least it was to me when I first uh, saw these numbers or looked into these numbers, uh, just because I, I, again, in my previous life, uh, coming from as chief economist at, at USDA, of course, the big focus was on how much we were sending to China. Uh, but they, too, are also a very, very big exporter, mainly things like fruits and vegetables and other things and mainly a lot of regional exports uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, but again, very big exporter. And then you can see, again, other countries, uh, Mary, or Mary or Jamie, I forget which, uh, mentioned the fact that, that India is, is such a large exporter of things like uh, beef. Uh, they have a lot of water buff buffalo that they sell. Um, and then Argentina, which, which frankly has been uh, penalizing itself over the last several years with, with uh, macro policies and um, uh, which with, with very uh, unfavorable exchange rates, and then on top of that, export taxes. Even with that, uh, still have, have shown some increases in in exports. And I think that that looking at projected projections forward over the next ten years, I think both Jamie and and uh, Mary mentioned the fact that that uh, Argentina is going to be uh, a potential uh, a force uh, to be reckoned with as well. 
And then um, let me turn now to domestic support. And here's just the OECD measures for OECD countries, the, produ the producer um, subsidy equivalent, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, where this measures the amount of domestic support going to uh, agriculture and measures it as a share of, of um, uh, uh, as a per percent of farm production, and that has been declining, um, uh, and I think this has been fairly well documented and talked about, but declining across the board largely because of reforms in, in some of the key developing country or developed countries. Um, and, and two, the other uh, major trend among that support has been a move away from coupled, highly coupled forms of support. And this shows, again, um, uh, support tied to output and then as compared to uh, support tied to input use. And while we have seen a little bit of uptick in, in that going to input uh, inputs, um, I think the other, the key uh, point here is that uh, decoupled support, uh, largely because of, of uh, reforms like in the uh, EU, which I think Tassos will probably talk about. Um, but again, very, I think in terms of two positive trends in terms of domestic support. One, declining support levels generally uh, as a percent of, uh, of overall ag production, and then um, uh, a move towards more uh, uh, decoupled forms of support. Well, here just shows by, by country, uh, essentially, the, uh, the uh, PSE, and then also shows as, as a percent of whether it's coupled or not. And again, as I mentioned, reforms in the EU um, uh, to a degree, the, e, the U.S., uh, and this is decoupled from production, which could include being coupled to price. So uh, Mary mentioned the ARC program and the PLC program, which are very large subsidy programs, but they're not tied to actual production. They're tied to historical production. So they still sh that's why the U.S. still shows uh, uh, decoupling here. But what I want to focus on are some of the developing countries, and again, the OECD doesn't cover a lot of developing countries. Uh, they are trying to increase um, their study and, and uh, you know, in recent years have included Brazil and uh, some very large uh, countries like Brazil and China. Uh, they are hoping to, that they can uh, bring India and start doing India, uh, uh, creating uh, similar measures for India. But you can see that in looking at their composition of support is a very different picture. That is the, the, that for the most part, it remains highly coupled either to input use or, or um, um, uh, directly tied to output with very little trends in, in actually decoupled support. And I get this, this shouldn't be surprising in one sense. Uh, I mean, de uh, decoupled support tends to be very expensive because it tends to be, you know, uh, cash and, and, and uh, other types of direct payments. Um, developing countries have chosen to go more the route of where, say, the U.S. and US, EU were many years ago in terms of uh, with direct price support by either purchasing or other sorts of uh, uh, methods. The other big thing has been the growth of insurance programs, and this has been phenomenal. I mean, Mary mentioned the U.S. program, which of course is quite large, uh, and I have on the chart on the right, you can see the, how the U.S. program has, inc uh, has increased. But just in a paper, I, I, I was looking at this issue earlier last year, and you know, we're looking at premium levels well over $30 billion now. I mean, just phenomenal growth over the last 10 years. And you look at a country like China where there was no, almost no uh, crop insurance programs or agricultural insurance, because in China at least it does include, include a lot of livestock as well, but no insurance programs to speak of prior to 2007, and now with a premium volume of over $5 billion U.S., also uh, very high subsidies. Well, the, the concern has been um, generally about things like, uh, you know, with, with countries like China, how, what sort of support levels they have and how those are, are influential on, on world markets. Here I show the, um, I, I take uh, a study done by uh, Fred Gale, who's at the Economic Research Service, has, has looked at a lot of uh, different Chinese policies. And what you've seen is since 2007, uh, price supports have increased in China. You can see how the, um, how the Chinese market price has, has been bolstered by these prices, and particularly at a time when world prices, here measured by the U.S. price, um, 
have declined. Not surprising, that's had an impact on, on one uh, harvested area in China where that's gone up dramatically over the last 10 years or so. And because th those prices are, are maintained so high relative to a world market price quite low, um, that's meant that, that China has accumulated a lot of stocks, which is the, what's shown on the uh, right-hand side there. Um, similarly, Mary mentioned uh, cotton. Uh, there, too, we've had very, very high uh, support prices for cotton relative to world market prices. And as a consequence, uh, ending stocks have increased dramatically. Uh, what I don't show here is that uh, cotton consumption mill use in China has also fallen. Why? Because of an increased uh, uh, domestic mill use in India, where India has, be has, has become an increasingly larger uh, uh, producer of yarn and fibers. China now imports a lot of their needs from, from India, and the combination of those two things has meant the import of raw cotton has, has declined, and of course that's affected both the US and, and Australia. Um, I mentioned India. Uh, India, uh, of course, has had, uh, uh, as has been a focus in, in the WTO or the debate over public stockholding. And India has a very extensive food security system that buys grain, holds grain, and then, then uh, um, uh, uh, distributes that grain to uh, the poor population. But again, in, uh, essentially an in-kind transfer, the concern has been, well, what happens if those stocks build up to such a point and then end up on world markets? And, and we did see some problems back in 2007, 2008, certainly uh, where, where those policies on top of that, there were things like export restrictions. And so uh, uh, stock levels increased substantially. Um, and then I, here I think I have a chart of that where you can see the, the uh, stock levels increasing up to about 2012 or so. And then gradually those have come down. Um, um, and so a lot of concern about uh, uh, the public stock holding and whether or not, and I think from, from, the, from many developed exporting countries like the US and Australia, we voice concern in the WTO at least that we want to make sure that, that whatever policies are maintained um, that, that we understand safety net policies, uh, and certainly, uh, 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 as Mary mentioned, the U.S. has enormous food safety or food uh, um, nutrition type programs that that uh, spend a lot of money of, on poor population. But the issue here is: do these things affect world markets? And I think the uh, one of the outcomes of Nairobi was to continue that discussion, and and um, as as sort of agreed to under the Bali uh, agreements of two years ago to, to try to get some agreement on the uh, um, uh, public stock holding. Well, there, there are disciplines uh, under the WTO. I mentioned the, the uh, of course, uh, things that, that affect uh, Australia and the US and the EU are things like the, the AMS bindings, the aggregate measurement of support. Um, that affects some 32-odd countries who have agreed to bindings uh, and agreed to both bind their levels of support and then it reduced them under the, the Agreement of Agriculture under the Uruguay Round. Of that, about 15 developed countries and about 17 developing countries. And, and many of these you'll, you'll see in the chart that I've shown just as uh, the next chart uh, shows that, that many of these are newly acceded members, or some of these are newly acceded members to the WTO, like Russia and China. And China. Um, also, of course, there's de minimis rules for developing countries. So if there, your support levels are less than 10% of the c current value of production, that means you don't report them to the WTO. So many countries who don't necessarily have AMS bindings, for example, they're fine as long as their level of support uh, it doesn't become a violation unless that level of support uh, exceeds the 10 percent. Now, for China, one of the agreements on their accession agreement is that instead of the 10 percent uh, de minimis, uh, they they have agreed to uh, they agreed to an eight and a half percent. And then uh, the the other thing that affects our uh, uh, developing countries is under the Uruguay Round Agreement on Agriculture, Article 6.2 allows. Um, a whole variety of support that are, are things like infrastructure uh, improvements and other sorts of things that uh, developing countries can engage in, and those are not subject to uh, 
uh, uh, re reduction commitments. And then lastly, of course, is the green box, which uh, uh, again lays out very specific rules uh, for developed and developing countries in terms of, of uh, allowable supports that have minimal or, or negligible trade or production distorting um, measures. Well, here is just, again, I mentioned uh, bound total AMS, uh, the 17 some odd countries that, that uh, developing countries that are, are, uh, have, have agreed to bind their levels of support, and this gives you some notion of what those are. Again, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the countries like Russia, quite large, but I think the, the bigger concern perhaps is the de minimis rule itself, which is some 10% of the value of ag production. And as, I, as we've seen in some of the previous, uh, uh, some of the previous uh, presentations where the value of ag production uh, has increased phenomenally over the last 10 years, and so that, that gives potential policy space, as it were, for developing countries. But I think that, that generally, the, the one thing that I would note is that countries like China uh, have realized that, that role are, seemed, are, are in the process of, of, of putting in place reforms that would lower supports and bring uh, some of those uh, distorting measures down because they too realized just like it took a very long time for the U.S. and the EU to realize these policies were not sustainable over the long run, that is, having large inventories and other things. And, I, and India, too, is in, in their most recent uh, uh, economic report, uh, have talked about instituting uh, policy reforms on, on the food security side. So let me uh, conclude here with just saying that, that I think there, there has been a lot of concern voiced about the increasing um, uh, domestic use of domestic use, uh, domestic support measures by developing countries. Uh, and as I mentioned, many people talk about the policy space that's implied by a 10% de minimis. Um, uh, but I think that, that a bigger concern for me in, in these negotiations has been, frankly, not a lot of this is notified to the WTO that, that uh, for in, in many cases for developing countries, they are very slow in reporting, and then uh, just some policies go either unreported or I think oftentimes uh, misreported. Um, it's interesting to me because following Nairobi, I think it's very unclear what happens uh, in the WTO in terms of multilateral trade negotiations in areas like domestic support. Um, you know, you look at, at uh, I think, a very good outcome, again, uh, is elimination of export subsidies. Uh, I think many people would have liked to see more reforms on things like export credits and food aid. But I think that, that there are at least one pillar where you, you've seen some, some uh, major progress. Uh, on the other hand, market access, well, not much done there, frankly, and under the WTO, then we look to things like TPP and TTIP and, and uh, in the case of the U.S. And, and certainly all the free trade agreements that Australia has initiated is that, that that obviously gives a lot of market access. But one thing that, that I think clearly drops off the table is domestic support. And I, I think an interesting question is uh, you certainly see it in the U.S. with concern over uh, increased domestic support in developing countries, whether or not that may be some impetus to bring countries back. Um, to the WTO, and I, I certainly hope that, that uh, we, we continue to see an active um, environment in, in Geneva or, or we see a renewal of a commitment to sort of look at some of these larger issues like uh, domestic support disciplines uh, as we move forward. And with that, let me conclude.